Hello and welcome back. Right. How is everyone? Any news or gossip? Anything worth, worth sharing? Bobo gets the award today for uh, early bird again. What early bird? The person to join a class many minutes before class starts. Oh, yeah, that's me. Yeah, you get the early bird award. Good, good. You can, uh, since you're so excited, you can present first. Okay. So let me just tell you what I have in mind for today. What I'd like to do is um, finish the two presentations for research projects we uh, left over from Tuesday. I believe that's Kyle and Bobo. Hopefully Kyle's here. I can't, I can't see everybody in, in the gallery. Um, and um, I want to talk about designing experiments uh, afterwards in the remainder of the time uh, and talk about some gotchas that, that have to do with uh, measurement and statistics and things like this. Uh, I, before I forget, um, I'm looking for two volunteers to present a paper each for next week in class. Uh, so kind of we're shifting more towards dissecting papers and and so figuring out why they're good or bad and, and things like this. Um, and I'm hoping you get to do more of this uh, presentation of, of papers going forward and then we can discuss them as a group. So two volunteers for next week. Anybody excited to uh, prepare a short presentation about a published research paper? What, what paper do we present? Is it any paper? No, I, I have a couple of specific papers in mind. Um, papers have to do with experiments, since we're talking about experiments. I will, I'll, I'll tell you what the papers are. I, I don't have them written on the slide here. Now, think about this during class today. I'm gonna call for two names by the end, okay? So you know, call call dibs or whatever. See who wants to uh, to be the victim for next week. All right. So without further ado, then please, uh, how about we start with Bobo and then Kyle with the presentations we had from um, last class, and then we continue with business as usual. So let's play with some um, pieces of trivia about numbers and nonsense. So I'm taking these from this book. Um, I recommended, I believe, at the beginning of the semester, this course from University of Washington uh, and uh, accompanying book. Uh, the book is called Calling Bullshit. Uh, and I've taken some of these examples from the book and I wanted to share them with you. I thought they were really interesting. So um, here's the first one. So let's say you're uh, traveling to some conference uh, and you get there late and you're tired and so on. Uh, you want to have a hot beverage before going to bed um, and you're sort of unsure whether to have a cup of coffee because it's so late and you don't want to stay up all night and whatnot you're already jet lagged and you find this packet of uh, hot cocoa in your hotel room that says 99 percent caffeine free okay. should you drink this before bed you know it's is it is it gonna is it gonna keep you up at night? Hannah says no. Do you want to elaborate, Hannah? Yeah, I mean I know because I read the book because you I thought it was cool. But um essentially in an actual cup of coffee, it's also like 99.9% .9 caffeine free because the actual caffeine is just that 0.1%. So you're getting the same amount of caffeine from this like cup of hot chocolate that you would from a cu cup of coffee. So it's very misleading. Right, that's exactly it. So the book goes into more, thank you so much, um, goes into more detail about sort of the arithmetic here and the calculation and uh, makes the argument that a 20 ounce cup of Starbucks coffee, like a, I don't know, drip uh, coffee, uh, also is 99% caffeine free uh, by, by weight, uh, which turns out to be so the calculation behind this hot cocoa uh, powder mix uh, so effectively, 
you know, um, this was a, a number that, you know, when you, when you see this number and you see numbers a lot, and we're gonna see a lot of numbers in the remaining part of the course, because we're gonna be focusing more on quantitative research methods and so studies that do things with numbers. Uh, but this, this is a great example of how misleading numbers could be on the surface. Right? So, you know, this is maybe a very impressive statistic that uh, would suggest, right, to a, to a reasonable reader, the first interpretation here would be, I would absolutely drink this, right? It, it seems like there's no, there's no risk at all that this would keep me up at night. That would be my first interpretation uh, when seeing this, because it's, it's basically entirely caffeine-free. So there's absolutely no, no risk of me uh, staying up. Right? Whereas if you actually sort of think about it a little bit more, it's entirely untrue. So that was a great example of how uh, you could lie with statistics, which is the title of the other book that I highly recommend. This is a book from a long time ago, uh, How to Lie with Statistics. It goes over a number of these things uh, that people do um, with ill intent or with, with well intent. Uh, good intent, uh, that, that's sort of besides the point, but it sort of shows how um, you could um, sort of spin numbers in, in pretty much any way you would like uh, to, uh, to prove any point you're, you're looking to make. This reminds me of a joke, by the way. Um, I think I stole this from the book as well. So it goes like a mathematician, um, an engineer, and a data scientist are applying for a job. And as part of the screening interview, they're asked a series of, uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, mathematical questions. And the first warm up question in that series is, uh, what is two plus two? So the mathematician without hesitation says four. The engineer uh, thinks about it for a little bit and says, typically most likely four, sort of uh, so thinking of maybe, um, I don't know, measurement errors and things like this that occur in practice. Uh, and the data scientist thinks about it a little bit more and says, what, before I give an answer, you know, what would you like it to be? That's sort of a joke about how you can spin numbers uh, and statistics to prove any point you're looking to make. And uh, often you'll see that people, you see people doing that in research papers. All right, here's another one. Speaking of interpreting numbers, maybe you've seen this. It made a huge splash on uh, social media and popular media last summer. This was a um, study. Uh, I, I'm a screenshot here is from one of these uh, popular media outlets uh, online. And the, this is a study looking at the impact of tweeting about research papers. Okay. Uh, and what's so cool about this study is that it was an actual experiment with random assignment to either a tweeting condition or a, a non-tweeting condition. So the kinds of evidence that they uh, are able to provide with this is, at least on the surface, much, much stronger, right? Much more convincing than an observational study might be. Okay. So the headline here is that tweeting about research results sorry uh, tweeting about research results in three times more citations right so wow like you read this you know thinking you know let me get on twitter right away and uh, and tweet about my papers so this is technically true okay but if you actually look at the fine print in the research paper which i was curious and i and i did uh, and you can see the citation here um while this is technically true, um, if you actually look at the absolute numbers of uh, citations that you can expect to gain by tweeting about these research papers, the actual number, uh, the actual increase in number of citations is about two. So yes, you, you get on average three times as many, but in practice, that translates to just about two two more than you would have gotten otherwise. Okay, so, so this reminds me of the caffeine example from a minute ago, how, um, to me, how misleading, right, uh, this finding is. When I, when I hear, you know, um, three times more citations, I think, wow, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna be famous, right? Uh, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great thing to do. Let me, let me do that right away. 
Um, and if you actually look at the data uh, at the absolute values, uh, note how on the y-axis they're giving the actual numbers, not the um, so the actual number, absolute number increase in citations, not the ratios. Um, the actual number is much less impressive. You know, while this effect seems to hold, the actual magnitude of it is, is rather small. So you know, you can rethink whether you want to uh, spend all your time on Twitter now uh, if if all you're getting is two citations out of this. Okay, so this is about numbers and nonsense. Um, here's a couple more uh, cool examples. I guess we're excluding Hannah from the discussion here because she's read the book. Let's see if people uh, people haven't read the book. So um, there's this thing called the friendship paradox. Uh, and this goes like this. Most likely, the majority of your friends have more friends than you. Counterintuitive, right? How is that possible? I mean, I, I'm not sure about, uh, does this statement refers to the facts or the statistics or is it perception? It is, uh, that's a good question. It is, it turns out it is both. So let me give you one example of um, fact. So suppose you follow um, Rihanna uh, on Twitter uh, and 499 other people um, now, I just checked this uh, yesterday. Rihanna has over 100 million followers on Twitter. Um, and um, therefore, um, the 500 people you follow in total will, on average, have at least 200,000 followers each, okay? On average, because of this huge number of followers that um, Rihanna has. So if you're, uh, in this particular example, if you're considering these Twitter follower relationships as friendships, quote unquote, from the paradox, then this, you know, this would indicate that um, the majority of your friends have more friends than you do because chances are you don't have 200,000 followers yourself. Okay. I'm... I'm not following this averaging thing. Why is averaging reasonable to do here? Wouldn't it be just count the number, count the number of people that have more friends than me? Isn't that just the thing that I would do? Um, I, be, I think because of how the paradox is formulated with the most likely and the majority of friends, it sort of implies this statistical argument is my interpretation of this. Uh, so it's, I, I guess so that implies some calculation of um, the average number of friends that your friends have. Yeah, it, it's just like if I have if I have you know five hundred friends and four hundred and ninety nine of them have one, and Rihanna has a hundred million. This is like not. This doesn't satisfy this condition, right? I mean, it does in some sense. This is one operationalization of that statement that I have there on the left-hand side. Um, you know, you might you might disagree with uh, it being entirely precise, but it is a operationalization of, of that. It's sort of one way of implementing or of testing that uh, statement, that hypothesis. But I think I think you're right to say that um, you know this is all a, a BS because of this averaging effect with like one super popular person in your uh, network somehow that kind of throws everything away. Um, and you'd be right to, to uh, note that. But so here's the catch. Here's where it gets super interesting. Um, and I, I'm leaving this as homework. Uh, turns out that most people also have fewer friends than their median friend does. Okay, so the previous statement was about your average friend and it was so sensitive to this Rihanna effect. But what, what if we just, um, for every friend uh, you have, we count their number of friends and we just rank order all of your friends by their number of friends. And we look at the, how many friends the median friend of yours has in this list. 
Okay, so th this would remove the uh, sensitivity to sort of Rihanna-like outliers that have lots and lots of friends, because the median is sort of not median as a measure. It's not sensitive to these outliers, right? Um, like the uh, simple arithmetic mean would be. Do you agree with this? So the interesting bit was that even this seems to hold, and this to me is completely counterintuitive. Right? So if I can accept that the previous thing was sort of a fake um, piece of evidence, or, or not fake, but um, unsatisfying piece of evidence to uh, substantiate this paradox. Um, this one I sort of find much harder to wrap my head uh, around. Um, and so here's one piece of evidence of this. 84% um, of Facebook users have fewer friends than the median friend count of their friends. So most people have fewer friends than their median friend count. Okay, and again, median, which is not sensitive to this Oriana effect. So super counterintuitive. So anyway, so go check out the book, which um, explains in more detail uh, why this happens. But this is you know another example of how um, misleading um, numbers can be, despite I guess the perception that numbers are very hard, they're very precise. Okay, but you know these are all examples of how. Um, misleading they can be and how easy it is to, easy it is to spin them in, in any way you want. Here's another one. So um, do you often have to wait surprisingly long time for the next bus to arrive? Like I, I, I used to live on Fifth Avenue at some point. Um, and um, because we have the CMU pass, uh, the bus pass, I would uh, take the, the bus for a few stops on my way to campus um, whenever I could. But so I figured out that uh, because I was relatively close to campus, the only way in which it made sense for me to actually wait for the bus is if I saw the bus approaching, you know, as I was like um, leaving home. If I saw the bus coming like, somewhere on the street, it made sense to me to wait for the bus and so sort of take it for a few stops. And otherwise I had concluded that I'm better off just walking to campus because it would take me less time. But so here's a thought um, uh, experiment. So suppose that buses leave uh, the bus stop um, at regular 10 minute intervals and they're sort of scheduled or time to do that. Uh, so now if you arrive at an arbitrary time in the bus stop, how long do you expect to wait for the next bus on average? This is not a trick question. The intuitive answer is five minutes. Yeah, right? Because you're sort of, you know, you're either, um, you've, you've either just uh, missed it, and so you have to wait so closer to 10 minutes for the next one, or you're, um, uh, I don't know, so let's say you've missed it by two minutes, you have to wait eight, or um, you get there, you know, two minutes before the next bus comes, um, so then you only wait for two, and so on, on, on average, the expectation is that it sort of just averages out to, to five, right? It's kind of the, the middle point between uh, these two ends of the interval. Okay, so I, I, nothing tricky here, I hope. So now, so yes, uh, I, think, I think that's fair. So now, um, what, if, what if we allow some variation here? Like what if we can't, entirely precisely uh, schedule these buses to leave every 10 minutes on the clock um, because there's traffic and whatnot, but, but we can still enforce that they leave every 10 minutes on average. So we haven't changed the expectation here. We just uh, have maybe changed sort of some individual uh, departure times, but on average, we're somehow still ensuring that buses leave uh, every 10 minutes, okay? Um, Right, so 
this means that you know sometimes the time between buses maybe is it's, it's short other times it may extend you know can can go beyond 10 minutes and so on depending on traffic but somehow you know just assume for the sake of argument that we still ensure that on average it's still 10 minutes like before okay so how long do you expect to wait now Ten minutes. Carl says ten. It, it still feels like five for me because we have this average of ten minutes. Does anybody have uh, other numbers in mind? Hannah's not allowed to cheat because she's read the book. I think it might be probably higher than five minutes because the time that like assuming that bus intervals are like dependent on something so maybe traffic or yeah so like traffic you're probably trying to get on the bus at the same time as other people trying to get on the bus so you know in those cases if you're leaving in the morning and getting back um, at like five, you'd probably take longer. Cool. I'd like to revise my answer after thinking. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. So there's the minimum amount of time you could wait for a bus is basically zero seconds, which is 10 minutes less than the average between two buses. If you have one bus that takes longer, that is more than 10 minutes late, it changes the average wait time in a way that can't be canceled out by another bus arriving too early, it seems. So if you have one bus that arrives after 30 minutes instead of 10 minutes, this outlier pushes your average in the longer wait direction. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is that, I may disagree with Jeremy's argument, although I, I do believe it's more than five minutes, but uh, it's, it, um, so the expectation the reason the expectation is five minutes is because it's uniformly distributed every single time slot. But if two buses arrive at a similar time, that the distribution will shift uh, because you are more, more likely to get um, to get the uh, to wait for low. Uh, what do we say? Shorter time because we have two buses come at a close time. So, so I think the distribution is not uniform across the the range between zero to to some some time. I, I'm asking specifically about this so expected wait time, not about sort of individual um, wait times, right? So you know, assume you do this over uh, I don't know a whole year and you take the bus lots of times and sort of you know, what's the expected wait time on, on average over a long period like that. Uh, and to Ben's point from earlier, you know, this actually resonates with my experience when I used to live on Fifth Avenue. Uh, uh, the bus would come full and not even stop uh, at my stop. So, you know, even though, even though technically there was a bus, I couldn't get on it because it was already packed. Uh, but no, so I, I kind of, I'm discarding that entirely. If, if that was the comment you were making, I'm, I'm discarding that as a possibility. I'm assuming there's always room on the bus for one more person for you to, to get on. Um, I think, uh, so um, I think, I think um, another way to think about this and also, I think this might be uh, what Hombo was trying to say, um, is that you can think of your, um, you can think of your chance of um, arriving, you arriving at the bus stop um, as a uniform distribution on any of the time slots. Uh, so any possible time you arrive at a bus stop. So if there happen to be two buses that come, um, so if there's happened to be two bus, buses that come um, and um, so one bus come very late after another bus. So there's this large time interval in between of these two buses that there's no bus. It's actually more likely for you to arrive at the bus stop in this kind of long intervals than in shorter intervals where two buses come to closer together. Yeah, thank you, Sam. That was perfect. That was spot on. Um, that, that's exactly right. So um, it, it turns out it's not five minutes um, because 
you're more likely to arrive during one of these long intervals than during one of the short intervals. Uh, and as a result of this, you end up waiting more than five minutes on average. So here's an example to illustrate this. Uh, here, um, there's um, you, you see three 20 minute intervals and you see buses coming either 16 minutes uh, after 16 minutes uh, or uh, sort of four minutes to the next uh, milestone, right? So here, um, the average time between buses is 10 minutes like I enforced uh, from the beginning. Um, but you are more likely to arrive at the bus stop during one of these long intervals than you are during one of the short ones, okay? Um, so uh, actually, because of how these intervals are distributed, you have an 80% chance of arriving during one of the long intervals, in which case you wait eight minutes on average because the interval is 16 minutes long. So that's sort of the, the case we started from earlier, uh, the, the midpoint uh, halfway in the interval. Um, and you only have a 20% chance of arriving during one of the short intervals, uh, in which case you would wait only two minutes on average, the midpoint there. So overall, this averages out to, you know, 80% of the time times eight minutes plus 20% of the time times two minutes averages out to 6.8 minutes on average of wait time rather than the intuitive five. So, you know, another one of these examples of how, um, right, one for me, so how easy it is for me to get confused about numbers. So like think of, think of me reviewing research papers and so on or reading research papers. Like it's very easy to get confused uh, and, and this was a relatively simple example. Like, you know, imagine when they have multivariate things with lots of lots of things going on uh, and, you know, lots of measurements and lots of steps in data collection and so on. So very easy to get confused as a reviewer and a reader uh, and also very easy to mislead, right? So, you know, I, I could have I could have spanned this in uh, more or less any way I wanted to, to make you believe anything uh, depending on how I, I set it up. Um, so again, right, so more about how misleading uh, numbers can be. Okay, so I, the one thing I sort of promised uh, you at the beginning of the semester uh, that hopefully you will uh, get by taking this class is an, an heightened sense of skepticism towards just the world around you and, and you know, science in general, uh, science and research publications in your field. So hopefully these examples sort of motivate that a little bit, like make you skeptical of, of, of everything, uh, constructively, of course. Um, okay, yeah, right. So um, the, the um, reason why these things are happening uh, is a so-called an observation selection effect. So it's a sort of selection bias. But the, is the key issue is that there's some association between the very presence of the observer uh, and the variable that the observer reports. Okay, so you're the one um, observing these, these, these buses coming and, and whatnot. Um, the same for the, the friendship network from earlier, right? It's because of this association between the observer and the variable being observed that you experience these selection uh, effects here, these selection biases. That's sort of the, the key idea behind all of this. And just check out the book. There's a lot more stuff um, in there. Um, here's another example talking about kind of counterintuitive numbers. So here um, on the X axis, you see different musical genres. Um, and on the Y axis, you see the average age of musicians corresponding to those genres at the time of their death. Uh, and there's no reason why this be a line plot. So, you know, ignore that this is a terrible visualization in that sense, because there's no um, ordering between these categories, these genres. So, you know, uh, ignore the fact that this is a line uh, uh, plot. Just assume those are, uh, a scatter, think of it as a scatter plot or, or a bar plot, whatever you want. But so here, the interesting observation is uh, that rap and hip hop musicians, you see them at the very, um, right of the x-axis uh, tend to die at about half the age of performers in some other genres. Um, 
The y-axis is uh, clipped here, so it starts at 25, but just note that. Um, but you can see how the rap hip hop musicians die maybe uh, before 30 or so, uh, or around 30. And you know there are genres where uh, people die in their 60s. Okay, so this is real. This data is real, by the way. This, I'm not. I'm not making this up. Um, so th these are actual observed values. This is what's going on. So if I were to guess, um, I feel like rap and hip hop are relatively new genres. So the people that have died are probably early because, or the people that have died have not died because of old age in this sense. So um, whereas the other, I guess the older styles of music there, um, they still, they have like people dying in normal, old age to kind of balance out um, this factor, but for rap and hip hop, especially that that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Does that make sense? So see how this is a form of selection bias, right? Uh, probably the people that have died, the, the rappers and hip hoppers that have died, um, were all very young, relatively, and have died of some uh, unusual circumstances. They have not died of uh, old age like most people. And so that's exactly that's exactly the reason why you're observing this here. Um, so now, imagine this was a, this was an actual research study. Um, to their credit, the, the authors of the study um, to actually um, have a disclaimer in there with you know exactly this explanation that um, that Kyle gave. But guess how this was uh, picked up by media. Do you think anybody read the fine print? No, I don't think they did. Yeah, <laughs> nobody read the fine print, right? So th the way this was read was that, um, I don't know, like rap and hip hop are, um, I don't know, violent musical genres and all kinds of other things. Um, and um, so, completely uh, sort of skewing the uh, perception of, of readers about what was actually going on here. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm showing you here real empirically observed data, and I'm uh, giving, you know, examples of how this can be uh, hugely misinterpreted, right, without the proper uh, disclaimers and fine print. Okay, so this is something that will haunt you, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, for the rest of your careers. And so you have to think ten times, uh, you know, when you um, when you make claims in your research papers based on any kind of uh, numbers and evidence and whatever uh, empirical observations. Uh, think ten times about how they might be read and how they might be interpreted. For example, one best practice in, in this specific example uh, would be to embed this disclaimer in the figure itself. Okay, so that whoever is I don't know, taking the figure out of your paper or something, or only reading the figure and so not reading any of the, the fine print and, and the disclaimer somewhere else, right, has a much higher chance of actually getting this uh, and so not missing the point that you're making. Uh, of course, assuming you're uh, being honest to yourselves. So it turns out this is an act, um, there's a technical term for this. It's called uh, right censorship. So imagine you're tracking the life cycle of some rare chameleons on the island of Madagascar, um, and you um, so did some field research. You started, I don't know, a few years ago, and um, you, you sort of observed these chameleons for some number of years until your research funding ran out. So for those chameleons that you observed early on in your study, you were able to um, to observe their entire uh, lifespans. For those that you started observing later on in, in the more recent years, you, um, um, you, you haven't observed them dying just yet because you've you know, only just recently started observing them. So you have these individuals here that have yet to die by the end of your observation period. 
and you know you don't you don't know how long they're going to live or you know they might die right away but you know the second you stop looking or they might live for uh, however many years chameleons live on average uh, and so on so this is an example of um to write censorship like here maybe the most intuitive sensible thing you could do is to just throw out those individuals that you were not able to observe uh, their entire um, lifespans throw them out of your data sets right because you, you're uncertain about how long they might live uh, and just compute average lifespan of uh, chameleons from the remaining population um, and this much like the example of the musicians from, from earlier, is likely to result in a very misleading impression of mortality patterns among comedians um, because um, in these later years, you're only capturing these chameleons that have uh, died uh, abnormally young. Okay, and this will overall skew your entire uh, perception of mortality patterns across the population of comedians. Uh, because these ones that have died relatively young are presumably much fewer than um, and, and not representative of the population as a whole. Okay, so remember this technical term, right censoring. Um, we will uh, hopefully talk about so survival analysis as one type of statistical analysis technique that is so designed to deal with cases like these, um, and uh, that comes up often in the kind of empirical research that we do. Uh, but that's for a different day. Um, okay, we talked about this. But here's a cool, um, cool study. So this was all the rage, uh, and probably still is, um, so all kinds of organizations, the big uh, corporations and so on, are implementing these wellness programs. Um, so wellness meaning, um, what's a good description of wellness? The kinds of things you do, um, so preventative care, right? So not, not treatment of illnesses when you get ill, but sort of, you know, um, promoting a healthy lifestyle and uh, an active lifestyle and working out and, and so on. The kinds of things that you would do to uh, improve your health and to maintain, um, maintain good health to, to prevent um, illnesses. So like, why do you think all the corporations are uh, crazy about implementing these kind of wellness programs? You know, with, with gyms and all kinds of um, wellness things provided for free to all of their uh, employees. Why do you think corporations do this? help with um, sick days and insurance costs? Yeah, because they, uh, they subsidize health insurance, um, right? So the sicker you get, the more you skip work and your know, time is money for your employer. Uh, and the more expensive your healthcare uh, is and your employer subsidizes a part of that, okay? so. They do this uh, looking to improve the overall health and productivity um, of their employees so that they can spend less money on uh, health insurance and healthcare expenses, okay? So the research question is, do these programs work? And turns out, right, so there've been lots of studies comparing um, uh, employees within the same company, uh, so groups of employees within a company that either took part in these wellness activities or that did not. There have been lots of studies like these. Um, and there have also been meta-analyses, right? so studies of studies, um, looking at this body of evidence as a whole and concluding that wellness programs reduce medical costs and absenteeism, so people uh, skipping work because they're sick, and they uh, generate considerable savings for employers as a result of this, okay? So this was the um, meta-analysis of all of these different studies of employees participating in these programs. So do you, do you believe this? I think that people who participate in wellness 
programs would already be inclined to take care of themselves, whether or not the program existed. Mm -hmm. Right, because you probably uh, couldn't assign people randomly to participate in wellness or not. You were maybe just observing as a cohort the people that participated uh, and compared them to people that did not participate. Right, so there's a chance that maybe the kinds of people that participate in wellness programs are just healthier overall. Maybe the causal direction goes in the, uh, the causal link is in the opposite direction. So here's a super cool study from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It's a very cool study design, and this is an experiment, so that's why I'm talking about it today. So what they did is they randomized employees into either a treatment group or a control group. This is not interesting yet. Um, but what's interesting is that in the treatment group, they gave people um, the option to participate, but they did not require them to do so. So they still allowed for the possibility of self-selection. Okay. And the control group, they did not offer people uh, any chance to participate in these programs. Okay. So there were three resulting categories of people. Uh, those who were given the chance and took it, they chose to participate. Those who were given the chance and did not take it. Okay. And those who were not given the chance in the first place. Okay, so you can see how the first two subgroups were the part of the treatment group, people that were offered the chance to participate, and the other people in the control group were the people that were not offered this chance uh, at all. Okay, so it's a very cool design because um, you can compare outcomes between the two treatment groups. So I'll show you that in a second. So here's what they observed um, when they compared um, the treatment group as a whole to people in the control group. Okay? So they observed that being offered the chance to participate in these wellness programs had no effect whatsoever on fitness activities, employee retention, or medical costs. Okay, so. Um, I'm showing you there um, on the, the different lines, the different x-axis are different outcome measures, um, participation in running events, number of gym visits, whether people quit their jobs, uh, how much they spent on hospital bills, uh, overall medical spending, by a number of outcomes they measured, number of variables they measured. And there was no statistically significant difference between people who were offered to a chance to participate in wellness and people who were not offered a chance to participate in wellness along any of these. Okay, so completely disproving uh, all of these many studies that have shown otherwise. Okay, so what, what's going on? What's going on is what Jeremy intuited. If you compare uh, the two treatment subgroups, so the people that among people that were given the chance, compare those that took the chance and participated in wellness to those that did not take the chance, but were offered. Okay, There you see all of the usual reported disparities. Okay, So the people who took the chance uh, ran more marathons and went to the gym more and did not quit their job as often and didn't spend as much on hospital bills and whatnot. Okay. I'm seeing skepticism. I, I actually have a question. Does this comparison solve any of the concerns Jeremy just mentioned? Because Jeremy's concern was that we have a bunch of people that they, let's just say that they don't have a good habit of exercising or something like that. And this is, can serve as a confounding factor. 
So the effect we are observing is not the result of joining the wellness program, but may be the result of their habit of being health or something. This is Jeremy's concern. Mm -hmm. This comparison, you are saying that we still have, so I still see the existence of this confounding factor because team one and team two, that some of them choose to participate in wellness program. So these people, they join the wellness program and they also, they are more likely to have a healthy habit because they willing to join comparing with the other team. So it's still, the, still there is the existence of compounding factor. So what this study does is it substantiates that, it offers evidence for that confounding factor that you and Jeremy mentioned. It shows that the causal direction here is the opposite probably of the one that was claimed previously. So it's not that um, wellness programs lead to better health, but rather that people who are otherwise in better health and more eager to uh, work, exercise and so on are more likely to participate in wellness programs. But what if, so if the result was to confirm the existence of compounding factor, what if there is no, uh, the compounding factor has no effect? What if the only thing that matters is whether you're joining the, the, the program or not? You can still have the same compare, comparing result. I'm sorry, I don't follow Bobo. So if um, the confounding factor doesn't matter, so, uh, so, so the, the whether they have a habit doesn't matter. The only thing matters is whether they join the program or not. You can still see the same effect, the same difference in team one and team two because one group joined, the others don't. Um, I see. Okay, so I th I think I think what you're asking, and you know, please correct me. Let me see if I understand this. But I think what you're asking is, um, essentially, when did they measure these different things? Um, and, you know, is it that we uh, measured these differences maybe at the beginning of the participation in the wellness program? In which case, we can't attribute them to the program itself. Or is it that maybe they're measured at the end of the program or something? Um, so if, if that's what you're raising as an issue, I don't know how to answer that because I haven't read the original study. I've only read the description of the study from the book and it doesn't offer that detail. Um, I guess so. Okay, so we're actually going to talk about this, but I don't know how much time we'll have today. Um, we're going to talk about how to make causal arguments. And so the ingredients that you would need to provide in order to make claims about causal relationships. And um, I think the one you're raising so fundamentally has to do with timing. So the, the order in which these things have occurred. Right, so is it that people were um, predisposed to live healthier before the program, those that selected self-selected to participate? Or is it that the participation in the program itself changed their mindset and their habits uh, and um, they decided to be more uh, healthy as a result of the program, as opposed to them being already healthy uh, minded going into the program? I think that's I think that's what you're asking. Personally, I think that's another interpretation of what I'm asking. So I, I guess I'm punting the question for when we get to talk more about causal arguments because I don't I don't know the fine details of the specific UIUC study enough to be able to answer that. Um, okay, so. 
Oh, I guess we we're going to do that here. But uh, looking at uh, looking at the time, I was asking at the beginning of class for two victims, and you complained that I didn't offer any details, right? So it's sort of unfair to ask for uh, volunteers for something, but so not provide any detail about what the something is. So the the two, I agree. The two somethings are uh, the two papers I'd like us to discuss as a group uh, next class are the following. One is an experiment. Um, in, about the effectiveness of double blind reviewing in, in paper submissions, the paper about that. And the second paper is an experiment about the effectiveness of teaching students formal methods. So uh, I'd like to ask for two volunteers to present uh, each to each present one of these two papers uh, next week in class. For, for you know about five minutes or you know five to ten minutes maximum so short presentations okay hana for formal methods you got it anybody interested in double blind peer reviewing kyle says yes to double blind all right so i will uh, follow up with you and uh, point you to the the references so let, let's stop here and we pick this up on Tuesday um, with, um, with more discussion in depth about experiment design.